right, boys and girls. So as we just alluded to a little bit here, we've got someone who uh, I think we've all seen on TV at some point in time. We grew up watching the Speed Channel, all of us. Uh, you know, this is someone who you know, originally from the, the, the Northeast area here from, you know, like the rest of us, you now find your way down south a little bit to do the, you know, promoting the short track racing all over the country. You know, you, like I said, you've been on Speed Channel, you've been in uh, all over the place. So that being said, uh, this is Bob Dillner, everyone. Welcome to the show. I, we appreciate you coming on. We know you're a busy guy. Oh, no problem. Uh, anytime we can talk racing is a good thing. And uh, I, I've listened to the podcast when I'm driving my Ford F-250 down the road, going to from track to track. So I appreciate what you guys do. And you bring a, a unique perspective uh, to uh, racing for sure. Well, that's, that's a word you could use for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. A lot, a lot of people just say that they've listened to our show just to say that they have, but it sounds like with the unique perspective that you actually have been a listener of ours. So that's good. Yeah, well, Brandon Paul, uh, who, who is from Maine, uh, he actually uh, let me know about your podcast and I started listening to it. And like I said, I mean, listen, you know, some people are serious, some people are conversational, some people just like to shoot the you know what, and, and all of it is good for, for racing, especially short track racing, because we saw what NASCAR has done and, and NASCAR went like so far, you know, to, to one side in regards to trying to be just straight and narrow and buttoned up and politically correct. And, and it's kind of brought NASCAR down a little bit uh, over the years. And they're trying to change that a little bit. Uh, I mean, remember NASCAR was born baby with, with the, the Allison's and the Yarbros and Daytona and that 500 and fighting. And, and that's what it was about. And, and that's, my dad was a racer and, you know, he, he got suspended from Riverhead Raceway in New York, or actually it was Lyslip Speedway back in the day, um, because he did some things that were, you know, he wasn't supposed to do. So it, it just, you know, passion is what short track racing is about. And I, I think we've forgotten a little bit of that. So, the, you know, that's that's actually kind of a refreshing take to hear, honestly, you know, that, like you said, the, the, the sport in general seems to be going in a very buttoned up uh, manner, if you will. People are you know, you, you, the term we, we use a lot of, you know, you have a lot of robots now. You got a lot of people who just kind of read from a script all the time. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's you, you hear the same thing every time you see it, put a camera in some driver's face. So, um, you know, you, you, you originally started out in the Northeast here. You're from New York originally, correct? Yeah. Uh, take us on that journey, man. How do you, how do you go from the, the kid in New York to, you know, the, the guy that's, you know, is speed 51? How do you, how do you take us on that journey, man? That, I mean, cause it's not the typical driver's story, if you will, you, you have a much different take on things. Yeah, I was picked on, honestly, uh, all growing up because I lived in Long Island and yeah, uh, Long Islanders are a bunch of spoiled brats when it comes to the sporting world. I mean, you got two football teams, two baseball teams, a couple hockey teams, really three hockey teams and so forth. So, you know, everybody's sticking ball and, and having fun with the professional side of sports and uh, my dad was a racer and we went to the racetrack all the time. Uh, he quit when I was young and basically he wound up, uh, we wound up going to the racetrack, Islip Speedway, which is where it started out. That place is now a cookie factory, which sucks. Um, but, uh, you know, he would get one of those orange seat back chairs, put it into the grandstand, take his belt off, strap me into the chair. I don't know why, because if I fell out, I'd fall in the grandstand and just still be strapped to the chair. But he'd give me his steering wheel from his old figure eight race car. And uh, I'd pretend I was my favorite race car driver on the racetrack, Charlie Drazan back and Fred Harback and Richie Evans and all those guys. So that's really how it, you know, started for me. But I remember people asking me when I was in grade school, hey, Bobby, what are you doing? You, you want to go to the Yankees game? Ah, I'm, I'm going to the racetrack. The what? You know, and, and it was neat to see as NASCAR evolved and got, you know, you know, more and more stardom and more and more spotlight that, you know, I moved away in 97 to go to North Carolina and now I'm up in Indianapolis. And, you know, what was neat is during that rise of NASCAR, I'd go back to the malls when I visited my folks and my relatives back in Long Island. And it was neat to see those Jeff Gordon jackets and the Dale Earnhardt Jr. jackets. And I'm like, see, I was ahead of my time. <laughs> For sure. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So, uh, you know, you were obviously the, the guy that, you know, I think we can probably, uh, uh, you know, relate to that a little bit, you know, that the, you know, the hockey's big up here, you know, stick and ball, like you said, and, you know, me personally, I was always the kid that wanted to go to the racetrack. So I get, I get being picked on there a little bit, but 
um, you know, that, how do you turn that little passion into, you know, being, being the guy that we see on TV? How do you, how do you end up down South and, and, you know, doing, doing television work? How does, how does that evolve into the journalism world? You know, the funny thing is, is, you know, this is a podcast that maybe some kids shouldn't listen to. And I'll, my <laughs> story is kind of probably goes along with that because I sucked in school. I was awful. I was a straight C student at best and uh, was always punished. My, my parents were pretty strict. Love them. Uh, but, you know, my, my dad would say, you don't get good grades. You do something wrong. You're in your room. You can't do anything but read or write. Um, and I always read, you know, Speedway Scene and Aerial Auto Racing News and all that stuff. And that was the only thing like I'd read. I wouldn't read my textbooks. So I started writing, you know, stories while I was punished uh, because of bad grades. And, you know, I'd write a bunch of those stories and just put them aside. And my room was a mess. And I remember my mom found it, apparently showed my dad. They brought me downstairs because I thought I was going to be like lectured some more. And they said, what is this? And they held up some of the stories and I'm like, oh, well, you said I can, you know, read and write. So I wrote some stories and they said, you know, we should take this and, and mail it in, mail, not email, uh, into, show you how old I am, into some of the papers. And uh, two weeks later, I got a call from Area Auto Racing News out of Trenton, New Jersey. And they said, uh, hey, you know, your stuff's pretty good. We, we want you to do some writing for us. And that's kind of how it began at, at 15 years old. Luckily, I was tall enough because I had to lie on my NASCAR license uh, to be able to get it. And I was tall enough to get in the pits, get that NASCAR license. And, and that first year at, at Riverhead Raceway, um, I didn't know any better. I, I wasn't your you know, prototypical journalist and I didn't know the rules. So I just wrote what was from my heart and, and what you know, people were talking about the hot topics. And uh, I remember I compared at Riverhead Raceway that year, the purse that they had at that year to like 20 years ago and how pathetic it was. And, you know, you had inflation rates and all that stuff. And the purse didn't even go with the, the cost of the race cars, which is still the same these days. But I remember I got the drivers, Bob Park, Steve Park's dad, was one of them uh, of like five or six drivers. I said, you guys need to strike. And so they parked their trailers outside in the parking lot at Riverhead Raceway and vowed that they were not going to come into the racetrack because of all this stuff that I was writing. And, and listen, as a 15 year old kid, you're like, wow, that's pretty freaking cool. So I, I remember going to sign in um, and Bob, um, Bob O'Rourke's wife, Martha was there signing everybody in. And when I got there, they said, uh, they said, you're not signing in this week. You need to talk to Bob. And she took the telephone and she threw it, telephone with a cord and threw it at my chest. And, um, you know, I got a talking to from, uh, you know, Bob and, and, you know, the Cromerties, which owned the track at the time. And, and that was my like little initiation into, in you know, the whole journalism and so forth world. And I got away from, I did that like for six years. And then in, in college, I had a mullet by the way. Okay. <laughs> Just to let you know, I was part of the mullet brigade. So I'm, I'm proud to be a brotherhood of you right there. Um, but uh, I thought I was going to be a DJ, you know, and I had the Bobby Sticks hard rock and countdown at, at college. And, and I got out of racing for about six months and then graduated and realized that that was not going to pay anything or do anything. And uh, last semester of college, got a, uh, an internship with uh, News 12 Long Island. Um, and uh, right out of college, got hired, uh, never was in TV before, ever. Didn't want TV, hated TV. Um, and they hired me and kind of just within the first year, um, you know, started to do different things and learn a lot of stuff. And I, I remember we had uh, nothing about racing on Long Island. And while I was covering murders and, you know, politics and, you know, economics and all that stuff, I said, we need a weekend show on racing. And I kept on pestering them. And, and basically the short story is uh, after you know, a bunch of pestering, they said, if you can raise the money and, and bring in what you need to do this show, we'll put it on the air for you, okay? So they kind of challenged me and they didn't think I could do it. 
And a couple of weeks later, I went back and said, got the money, let's go. And it became the, the uh, most popular, the highest rated show on the weekend for that network. And we really just concentrated uh, in the first couple of years around racing on Long Island, and then finally branched out to the Staffords and the Riverside Parks and Thompson and Oxford and all that stuff uh, thereafter. And I, I think that was like 92 to 96 or something like that. Shows you I'm dating myself a little bit, but that's kind of how everything began. And, and then, you know, got burned out from working a full-time job and that was a full-time job. So quit that after the 96 season got a call from somebody because I was supplying highlights of the uh, Wheel of Modified Tour to ESPN and TNN and their shows. And uh, they said, hey, where are the highlights from Thompson? I said, I didn't go. I'm done. I'm burned out. Um, and they said, what, what do you mean you're done? And I said, I can't do it anymore. They said, well, you're looking for a full-time job? I said, well, what do you got? They said, we're looking for a reporter. And literally, uh, they flew me down to Charlotte, right behind the Speedway, World Sports, uh, did all the television, uh, motorsports for TNN. And I went down there and they offered me a job. And I'm like, I went back, my wife was six months pregnant at the time. And I said, we're moving to North Carolina. And that's kind of how it began. That's, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> what a wild, what a wild uh, life you've lived so far. And it's really refreshing to hear, like, even going back to when you said that you were picked on as a kid. And then you, you getting into the motorsports world in a completely different aspect because it's, it's hard for someone that doesn't race. And maybe, like you said, your, your family stopped racing uh, early on. It's, it's hard for someone to keep coming back to the racetrack. And I think that we talked, maybe it was last show, a couple shows ago of, uh, you know, just even living, Charlie living in Scarborough, Maine and kids in his high school, not even knowing that Beatridge is right down the road. Like, I, don't, I, it, I can't wrap my head around it, but I, I remember being that weird kid in school that just... You know, I would be like, oh, I'm going to the racetrack on Saturday and everyone else wanted to go to the roller skating rink or something like even when we were like super young kids. And, uh, you know, I think that this this whole everything evolving with the racing media is just so important to just get people to even know that the racetrack's there, which is it's wild to me that people can just live their life and have no idea. I remember going up to Beechridge and, and seeing that place for the first time and just you know, every racetrack, almost every racetrack I, I went to, I fell in love with, especially as a kid. And it was something really cool going to star, you know, that, that little quarter mile. I don't know what it is now because I haven't been up there in a few years, but they didn't have walls and the, you know, the back stretch or anything like that. And cars going out into the woods and, and it was just like, holy crap. I mean, it's just incredible that these guys, these super modifieds and modifies were competing there and, and kind of risking their lives to some, some respect on, on being, you know, going off the backstretch and going into the woods. But I, I loved it, man. I mean, it, it was so cool uh, to be able to be a kid. And when I got involved in the, the writing side, the journalism side, I would go in the cube van with George Bernholzel and go up to Stafford Speedway or Joe Mamalito or Eddie DeHunt going up to Oswego and Ben Dodge's old race race team. And, you know, I remember, you know, <laughs> we, we were done with Oswego and trying to get some fast food and we couldn't fit through the, um, the drive through a Burger King uh, with the box truck that he had. And we wound up walking through the drive through right outside of Oswego Speedway to try to get some Whoppers after the races. You know, those are stories, you know, that, that you know, you just, you know, won't forget about. Or Joe Mamalito, you know, was a guy that, that wouldn't stop going to the racetrack. So he had this funnel, okay, and, and a hose that went outside the, the truck. And if you had to go to the bathroom, Guess what? <laughs> the funnel. I respect that. I've had some trips like that. I would have definitely made someone go about it that way. But uh, yeah, it's just that every going to every racetrack is such a different experience for us being from Maine. I, I think we were lucky enough where Beechridge was on a condensed schedule this year and Charlie races every Saturday night. And it kind of allowed us to branch out and go to places we otherwise wouldn't have gone. And so a lot of people look at us funny when like we say that it was an experience just to go to Riverhead to get on that ferry from Connecticut and go all the way over. Like, we, like I, I was, you know, we we're exhausted. We, we might've partied the night before allegedly. And uh, we, we only got an hour or two of sleep. And, and so then we're getting on the ferry and I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to sleep it. I'm just going to sleep throughout the whole trip. And, and uh, Charlie's like, no, I think I'm going to experience this. Like, this is something wild to me. And, and we were lucky enough to hit about 50 tracks or not 50 tracks, 50 events this year, like seven different States and 
and I really branch out, but it's just that experience like kind of brought out the little kid in me. I know that for sure. You know, you mentioned the ferry and man, I used to do that Orient Point. I was in Long Island, so I'd always call it the Orient Point Ferry and to go up to Thompson or Oxford or whatever. And um, I remember one time, I think it was one of the banquets for the Wheel of Modified Tour, the old Bush North series or something like that. And uh, we were coming back and my brother was with me and, you know, the seas could be pretty rough where the sound meets the ocean there. And um, I, I had to go to the bathroom. So I'm in one of the stalls and, and I remember just, you know, kind of flopping back and forth. And all of a sudden somebody goes into the stall next to me and just, you just hear what happens after you get hung over for a night and it's all <laughs> over the floor and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is disgusting. And I'm trying to get out of there. And then I hear the dude talk like, you know, he grunts or whatever it was as my darn brother. <laughs> <laughs> If you can't party with the big dog, stay on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, uh, so throughout this this little journey here, you know, getting picked on in school and then you know end up on TV. That's kind of that's kind of a nice subtle little middle finger to everybody who wanted to pick on you for, for going to the racetrack, right? So during any of this process, did you ever want to actually drive or or be a part of a team or any and be on that end of things, or were you very much the I want to report the story type of guy. No, I, I'm, I'm, first of all, I don't like to say I'm a part of the media. I like to say that I'm a, a TV guy, a racer that just happens to be a TV guy. So um, I'm just a, a racing fan, but I wanted to be a racer. I wanted to be, you know, my heroes growing up, man. And um, I, I've raced a bunch. Uh, I haven't raced for a couple of years now, won a couple of races, um, you know, won a, a figure eight race in Michigan, uh, won a race up at uh, Black Rock Speedway uh, up in New York. Um, I was actually better on dirt than I was on, on pavement, um, but uh, won a street stock race down in the Carolinas. So I used to race about, about five to 15 years ago, that span of 10 years, uh, I would race about 20 something races a year. Um, but growing up, you know, my mom and dad didn't have the money, you know, uh, that say the Logano's hat. Okay. You know, Joey's very blessed and he'll tell you that, you know, in regards to his dad, Tom and, and their family being able to do what they did for him. Uh, but we just didn't have that. Uh, there, there was a reason why, besides the fact that my dad said he sucked. Uh, okay. Well, he didn't have the money to race and he's raising two kids, my brother, Matthew, who's part of the Dale Jr. Download and myself, you know, and, and and we could just afford to go to the racetrack. So I didn't get to start racing um, until I was in my, gosh, um, late 20s. And um, so a late bloomer, um, you know, they just, you know, they went to that youth movement and I was doing so well. And they just didn't want like a 30 plus year old guy anymore because of the Loganos and stuff that were coming up through the rank of, so although I had so much potential, um, I kind of just stuck to the TV route, but no, I did. I I really wanted to be a racer, still do. I said, you know, when I'm 51, obviously 51 is important number for me. Um, My dad was the number 51. That's where that whole thing kind of came from. Um, I said, when I was 51, I am going to be the, uh, the oldest rookie of the year somewhere in America, in some <laughs> sort of racing. I like that answer. That's, it's funny you bring up the 51, because that's literally one of our questions here for you is why not, why not speed 52? Why not speed 50? <laughs> what, you know, where did, where did that come from? You guys should start speed 52 because it would be, you know, one better than speed 51 right now. Um, but it was my dad's number. I don't know why it was my dad's number uh, before he passed. I, I never got a chance to, to, to ask him that, but you know, we just, we loved our dad and I still have in my office t- to this day, you know, I have um, their, their billboard, not billboard, but they had like this little banner and it's really like old school kind of like sticker on fabric and it was 51 and it had the American flag on it on the bottom. It was, we try hard. And uh, it was him and, and my uncle, um, his brother, uh, John, and they, they raced figure eights and drag cars and all that stuff. And uh, it, I just remember seeing that in the back of our garage growing up. And there was just so much pride that my dad was a race car driver. And when I moved to North Carolina, um, my brother actually went in my dad's garage and he cut out the back, not just took down the, the, uh, the, the banner, but he also cut the, the wood 
And I have that framed up in my office to this day um, because the only thing that we can do is try hard. So everything that I did, you know, whether it was baseball or racing uh, when I raced, um, every time I had the opportunity, I put, you know, 51 on it. And, you know, we tried when I, I remember having this conversation with Speed about uh, the website because originally it wasn't Speed 51. Uh, we came up with the name 51sportsracing.com, which was really big, long, and awful. And we changed it really quickly. Um, so, you know, I was working for Speed at the time. My favorite number was 51 because of my dad. So we put it together in Speed 51. Um, we didn't really want it to be like, you know, loud pedal or, or you know, the top groove or, or something like that, you know. Uh, we just wanted something unique and we just kind of married those two things together from my life. And um, I mean, I, I miss Speed. You know, Speed was, uh, you know, a back to the bone network with a lot of racing. And now I'm with Mav TV and, and they're trying to create that but minus the NASCAR side of things. So I love the fact that, you know, you got the chili bowl that I get to do and dirt late models and ARCA and all sorts of stuff. So it, it's just, I'm blessed, man. I'm just lucky, honestly. Um, a lot of other people could do uh, what I do. And I've been just fortunate enough to be able to meet the right people at the right time to get to do what I do. Well, it, it sounds like you touched on it there a little bit. I mean, we got some events coming up here. It sounds like yeah, the, the general gist of Speed 51, I, I don't know if you want to tell us the exact mission statement, but, you know, it, it's it's basically the, the short track racing, you know, community on, on one little one little area, one little network in which you can, you know, watch, you know, whatever race that you can't be at, you know, throughout the entire country. So uh, we, we got the Chili Bowl coming up. We got Speed Weeks coming up. So you're going to be down there. You get, what, what's, what's the plan for Speed 51 throughout all that? Yeah, so Speed 51 is doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, Speed Fest will be the you know first big event, right? Uh, so that'll be down now in Florida, uh, just announced yesterday. So Speed 51 will be there providing all the coverage. And uh, the week after that, we're on the dirt in, in Lakeview, South Carolina. Um, you know, we'll have tons of stuff. ARCA Midwest Tour, CRA, Southern Super Series, Tri-Track Mods, ROC Mods, all sorts of stuff all over the country. And, and Speed 51 will continue to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I love going down the Snowball Derby every year. That's where I met, you know, you guys. And uh, hopefully we'll see you down there again this coming year because that is, it just reminds me of the old race of champions back in the day um, at Pocono and Flemington. Um, you know, where you have it circled on your calendar all year long. And, and I remember going to Pocono and, you know, there'd be, you know, close to a hundred modifieds there. And we would sleep in the back of my dad's pickup truck with a cap on it. And that, that snowball derby has that same feel. So speed 51 is going to be involved with all that stuff. Um, Brandon Paul's really kind of heading all that stuff up now. And, you know, um, you know, it, it's kind of a deal where they do such a good job. I, I don't have to be involved with that. And that allows me to even do other things, uh, promote races, uh, to, you know, create different things within racing that add more exposure to short track racing and all my work with Mav TV and Lucas Oil. I mean, the Chili Bowl, dude, they, they asked me like three, four years ago when Dave Despain was retiring, they said, hey, could you, could you do me a favor? Dave's retiring. Could you be the host for the Chili Bowl like Dave has been? And I'm like, <laughs> what? I mean, like Dave Despain and Ken Squire and those guys, they're like my idols. And, and gosh, I still get, you know, chills to think that I get to be the host of the Chili Bowl live on Mav TV. I mean, that's something for a kid from Long Island that I, I never would have thought that I would be able to do. Um, so to do that, and, and I'm now in love with dirt late model racing. And I know you don't have a lot of that up there, but listen, you ever want to come to a Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series show, you let me know and we'll get you in and we'll, we'll show you kind of a little bit of an old school approach. I mean, dude, they have three laps of practice, yep. three laps of time trials that go right into heat races. That's it. Yep. Practice? There ain't no practice like I, I, Alan Iverson said, you know, so uh, I, I love it. And, and we have the, uh, the Florida Speed Weeks now because of COVID, the Georgia portion of Georgia Florida Speed Weeks was canceled. But uh, all that's going to be uh, live uh, on, uh, you know, some of it's live on Mav TV, some of it's live on their streaming platform. And I get to do all that. And I think we're doing like 
12 or 14 races uh, in like 14 or 16 days, something like that. So uh, just try to stay <laughs> primed, ready, hydrated, and uh, ready to go for the racing season. Looking forward to it for sure. Well, we're definitely going to be down there for speed weeks. We we don't really have a super concrete plan yet. We basically just have a, a tickets and we're going to show up and see what happens for the most part. I don't know where we're staying or anything yet, but um, it'd be cool to meet up with you at some point and see see what we can do. But uh, I mean, you've, you've touched a little bit on like the chili bowl and, and speed weeks and all that stuff. So, you know, throughout the country, you know, speed 51 does a lot of things you get to, you know, you're very fortunate to be able to go to a lot of these events. You know, what are some of the maybe the marquee events that are underrated or, you know, places that you should say, hey, you need to go to this, but you maybe have never heard of it? Well, it depends on what perspective. Are you looking for good racing? Are you looking to party? A combination of both? B, all of the above. <laughs> Listen, anytime you can go to the Midwest, I'm telling you, nobody can party like the Midwesterners. Um, all of us, because I'm a native Northeasterner too, you know, we think we're good. <laughs> we ain't got nothing on those people up from Wisconsin. I tell you that. So there's two races up in Wisconsin that I think if, if you're a short track racing fan, you just got to experience. And that's the Slinger Nationals, uh, quarter mile, mega high banking racetrack. Um, and that's always fun at Slinger Speedway in the middle of the summer. And then Oktoberfest at Lacrosse Fairground Speedway in Wisconsin. It, I went up there one time, it was snowing, they were still racing in the snow, and then it was done and everybody was over at the barn and up on tables and drinking and having a good time. Um, you know, I, I think that's good. Winchester 400, I mean, that's a, that's a big one there in Indiana in October. Um, 37 degrees of banking. Um, you don't have that in New England, so somebody needs to get there to see that at some point. Um, you know, and, and then on the dirt, listen, I still haven't been to the World 100. Ooh, uh, that sucks. It's like on my bucket list, baby. And now that I'm up here in Indianapolis, you know, that's about mm, about an hour and a half away, uh, maybe two hours. So I'm hoping to get to that. But um, I, I would say for like, you know, your area, um, Lucas Oil Speedway. And I know I sound like, a, you know, a homebody, you know, because I do a lot of work with Lucas Oil and Mav TV. But that racetrack out in Wheatland, Missouri, it is the epitome of the field of dreams. There is nothing for miles, and I mean miles, like, like the nearest big town is like an hour away. It's a population of, I think it grew to 386 last year for the town. It doesn't even have a stop light. It has a stop sign. Um, so that racetrack in the middle of this field and these, the cattle and all that stuff pops up this just majestic racetrack that is just beautiful. And it, it is the field of dreams in dirt racing. And the show me 100 that they have there in May is fantastic. So, you know, I think you would be surprised if you, you ever got out there, they actually power wash, power wash for a dirt track, every square inch of concrete. They have a go-kart track on site. They have a bar, they have a restaurant. The pits are paved. Um, that's just kind of like, you know, a little bit of a taste of what I get to experience because whenever I go somewhere, I try to hit a new racetrack. I'm up to 293 now. Um, and my boys from Speed 51, they asked me to count. I didn't even know like three years ago. So I did go and I was on a cross country flight. So I just got out the National Speedway directory and started counting. And so I'm, I'm climbing closer to that 300 mark. Well, we're, we're, Hot on your tails. I think we're probably <laughs> at like 20 or 30, but <laughs> we'll get there eventually. I know that. So for us, it was cool. Obviously the Oxford 250s every year, August now. Um, and it's, it's hard for us. to Bonfire. It's, it's, it's hard for us to like gauge it compared to the other marquee events throughout the country, but it was wild to us that two, two kids that had never been to the snowball derby before um, grew up in Maine, obviously both of us. And, and we flew down there this year and that was just so wild and like you can't even compare it to the oxford 250 like it, it i i don't want to disparage the oxford 250 by any means because we're still gonna go everyone should still go it's the event up here like it that it, it needs to be attended obviously but it was like some people were saying that like it makes the oxford 250 kind of look like child's play so like the the marquee 
events, I guess, around the country, would you, would you say that, you know, in no particular order, but Snowball Derby, Oxford 250, Winchester and Slinger, are those like the, the, the main ones? Cause I think that this year, my goal, it would be cool for us to get to Slinger just cause we have friends out in, in Wisconsin. So um, I think that that's, and it's something ba very banked racetrack, something that we don't have up here. So I'd, I'd like to go get around and start experiencing and getting closer to that 250 number that you just said. 293 uh but <laughs> i rounded right i rounded uh, down to try to yeah, get I, I, I think i think you were right you know uh slinger it's not a crown jewel i i believe that there's only four crown jewels in super late model pavement racing and, and you name three of them you know with snowball oxford 250 and i think oxford 250 is the big, biggest single day super late model race in the country snowball derby listen it's the granddaddy of them all it's perfect storm end of the year, Florida, come on. So, you know, then you have the Winchester 400 and the All-American 400 at Nashville. His history at that place, it's just kind of cool. It's got a charisma all to itself. But I, I look at some of those other races like Slinger, you know, uh, that is just, it's fantastic. The Rattler um, down at uh, South Alabama Speedway in March. Listen, Anytime you can go to a place where the winner has to put a rattlesnake around his or her shoulders, that's, that's badass right there. And I, I don't know if I do it. I, I might say, keep the check. I'll take the trophy and I'm going. Well, even the trophy has a snake in it too. It's dead or, yeah, well, or I don't, manufactured. I don't do snakes. That's like the one thing that makes like my dress blow up over my head and make me squeal a little bit. Like I, I just don't snake at all. Uh, that makes, that makes two of us. So, yeah, it is it is kind of a problem there for sure. Uh, and like the Toilet Bowl Classic. I don't know if you guys have heard that one. You know, we're just kind of getting into oddities, right? But the Toilet Bowl Classic, I think it's uh, Tuckasegee Raceway or something like that. I think it's in Tennessee. And it's early. It's like in January or February. And, and the winner, the trophy, is a porcelain toilet. And the winner sits on the toilet in victory lane. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I, think, I think that that's... That's part of what makes, um, you know, particular things an event, though. That's what makes it the destination. You know, yeah. I mean, you touched on it a little bit ago. You, you got the World 100. You know, the World 100 trophy has a globe in it. Uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, uh, the king, the you know, king of the quarter mile at Lima Land, things like that. You know, they, you know, you got a crown or the King's Royal, things like that. Um, you know, which I think is what you and Speed 51 did such a good job at for the Snowball Derby. You know, we've we've touched on it before that was an event and you know it's it's one thing to go to a racetrack and watch cars go in circle that's great that's that's the the essence of why you go to a racetrack but what you guys did and what speed 51 did is you made it a spectacle you know you had the jumbotrons in the in the corners there you had the you know the the pit lane reporting you had the fan zone out front there was i racing set up and it was very much um you know nascar-esque in terms of you know it was a show you made it an event and and there's a lot of things that i i would love to adopt what you guys did down there to other events you know there's not there's no reason why that same exact scene couldn't be made at oxford for the 250 and elevate it that much more and i think that that's what you guys do such a good job at with making these things not only the the event that it is but promoting it and helping it become the spectacle that it needs to be for more and more people to want to be involved. It, you know, maybe I'll hire you someday because, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is outside of Speed 51 right now too, with promoting some of these races, which, you know, listen, I wound up doing them, you know, on my own, you know, with, with a couple of good people that, that work with us. And we want to just do different stuff. I remember watching, you know, uh, the Joey Chipwood Thrill Show uh, at Islip when I was growing up. And I loved twice a year they would come. And it was just something a little bit different or some BMX bikers that would flip or, you know, a concert or just something fun. And, and I think, you know, from the pavement side of things, because dirt still got it. Dirt's got it. Pavement people don't get it right now. And I know a lot of pavement people are going to be mad at me. Dirt is so much better than pavement right now, both from the racing standpoint, as well as the show that they put on. And they kind of go hand in hand. But I think since ASA left, since some of the history in regards to some of the racing, even um, whether it's New England or the rest of the country, some of the pavement races have lost that flair 
and okay, now it's high dollar and it's, it's got to be regimented and rules and this and that. Some, not Greg McCarns, listen, Stafford, they do a great job down there. You know, some promoters actually get it. Some don't. And I, I think we really need to bring a lot of that back. I, I'll tell you, one of my ultimate goals in racing is, uh, you know, and, and we're getting closer and closer. Uh, I, I would love to see a national super late model series come back like the old American Speed Association. Um, you know, it had national TV coverage. It had, you know, it was like the circus was coming to town when ASA would show up, whether it was Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or Montgomery, Alabama, or wherever it, it was. It had your mega stars, your Mike Eddies and your Bob Senecas and your Dick Trickles and so forth. And then it had the new up and comers, you know, the Johnny Sauters and the Kenny Wallaces and, and Mark Martins and all those people that kind of came through ASA. So I'm, I'm going through the process right now of, of honestly, and I really haven't been public about this, is trying to put together the pieces of the puzzle. And this is going to piss some people off, um, but to have something like that. And, you know, we have, we have a lot of great regional tours around America and they do a fantastic job and they need to remain uh, because you need feeder systems. Um, but we, we're getting closer and closer to being able to do something on a national basis with super late model racing. So what is it, what is it that's missing then? Because, you know, just, just purely based off of regional status and what we're used to, the Pro All-Star Series, Tom Mayberry, that that's a great is... Job. That is for us, that's the pinnacle of where you're going to go before you end up in either ARCA or, or, or whatever route you choose to take. Um, but that being said, you know, the Pro All-Star Series, you know, to me, that would be that I would love to race in that series. I would love to be in a super late model in general. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my next step, my next goal that I would love to be a part of. But that being said, the Pro All-Star Series, it has a little bit of a, I don't know what's missing because there's no real hype about particular races. There's no real uh, status that comes with being the pro all-star series champion sometimes. And I think a lot of the reason with that is, is that, you know, by the end of the season, you know, you might have 30, 40 people on the points list by the end of the year, but maybe five or six actually went to every single race. So is it, is it a money issue that you think that is holding back what you're talking about creating a national series where people can, you know, that, that work nine to five or whatever, but still have a race team on the side. Is that what's holding people back from being able to do this cross country national tour? You know, what's the missing link here? Number one, Tom Mayberry doesn't get enough credit for what he does. Uh, he is one of the hardest working guys that I know in the business and, and he, he rules with an iron fist and he gets criticized for that a lot, but I promoted races with Tom. And, uh, you know, back in 2006, when Pass South started, he and I put that together. And, you know, I, I love Tom. And, you know, I don't know why people beat up on him. Because I always say, listen, if you're going to, you know, beat up on him, why don't you start your own damn deal and find out what it's like to have the risk of all the money. So people got to stop beating up on Tom Mary, May, Mayberry because he does such a good job for, for New England. Um, but I think it's going to take what Tom Mayberry does um, from a racing standpoint and add to it a little bit of, of, of flair if you're going to make a, a national deal much like the American Speed Association. And what you said, it's going to take money because you need to have that bonus program. You need to have the points fund. You need to have what ASA had is you knew 10, 12, 15 drivers would show up because those are the national drivers. And then you would have the regional or local guys that would actually go in there and be part of the deal as well. And now you got a field of 30, 40 race car drivers and, and you got like, you know, regional wars and, and, you know, you're not coming into my racetrack and taking me down and I'm a national guy and I'm gonna come and whoop your butt. You know, so there was that charisma to it, but that only happens if you have a good bonus plan in play to make those national guys come. I mean, these tires aren't going to pay for themselves. You know, Hoosier's got the monopoly on everything right now. And to quite honestly, they're like the, the, the one of the only ones making a lot of money in racing right now, no matter what the economy is. All right. So um, people like Hoosier 
you know, need to step up a little bit more, put more money back into things, hopefully, you know, on the regional level, as well as a national level, if we ever get there, uh, and then make it an, uh, an event, you know, uh, make it where people want to come and camp. They want to come and have a good time. Maybe there's a concert. Um, there's just different stuff going around. I think the snowball derby, the bonfire at the Oxford 250, those sort of little things just add to the ambiance, but we need more of that. So I think it's a combination. And, and listen, what is going to drive things is helping these racers to a certain degree. You don't want to cater to the racers because I agree with what Tom Mabry did. You, do, you cater to a racer, then you're going to open up a Pandora's box that you're never going to be able to close. But you come up with a good set of rules and, and you listen to what they need in regards to schedules and so forth. And you really work with them and make them feel that, and they would be part of what you're doing. And I, I, Bubba Pollard's a good buddy of mine. And we talk a lot about that. And, um, you know, I, I think it's going to take without, you know, um, revealing the entire deck of cards. Um, it's going to take a whole big concerted effort of a big sponsor, uh, which will provide the money that you need for what you got to do with that tour, go to the right places and, and have it spread out and not just regionalized and don't come back with the national tour more than once per year to the same racetrack and national television coverage. That's important too. Well, I, I think that that's pretty much, you know, everything that we've been saying for a while now, you know, I, I, I'm a huge, huge, huge advocate for the, the theory or the notion that automobile racing, stock car racing, specifically what we do and what we love, you are not, if you are in the position of either owning a track, a series, uh, what you do with the media, things like that, you are not in the racing business, period. That is, you are not. You are in the entertainment business. Entertainment is what brings people to the racetrack, hence gets you money, hence gets people there makes it the bigger spectacle so that people will want to be involved in the racing industry. So everything that you just said is super refreshing to hear. I'm glad that, uh, you know, you guys on your end of things with the media and all that understand that. I think that that has been lost for quite a while, honestly. Um, you know, especially like you said, catering to the race car driver. The last person who should have any say in the matter in terms of how the show goes is the guy driving the car, because at that point, it, it, what's the point, you know, what, you know, what are you going to do that, uh, entertains people or gets people wanting to go if you're only catering to one person. So that's, I think that that's the, the perfect thing to say. You got to be careful of, of the, you know, the media too. Um, you know, media is good. Like, you know, listen, what you guys do, you're really not, you know, per se media guys, right? You're just lovers of racing. That's what I want to see more of. You know, I don't necessarily agree with some of what the, the media does these days, um, but if they love it, that's fine. The, my problem is, is everybody's got a voice and, and to some degree, journalism has been lost um, in the fact that everybody thinks opinions, which is great and commentary is great, but it's just commentary and, and opinions. What we're doing today, hey, we're three dudes just talking about racing because we love it and that's, that's good for racing, but it, it's, it's not what a lot of the media portray them at, themselves as, which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a factual guy. No, you're, you're stating your opinion on what should be. And there's a difference between the two. And I see a lot of that all over the country. And we got to be really careful about that because honestly, perception is reality. And sometimes when we, we shout out all these opinions, uh, they become facts somehow. And, and it's the way it's delivered. And, and that's something that's really got to change. And I've talked to a lot of the industry people about that, including the promoters and stuff. And, and trust me, they're very frustrated with it. Do you think that the, the battle to be first sometimes uh, <laughs> in, in terms of, uh, you know, promoting and, uh, uh, you know, getting the word out that that, that maybe is a, a hindrance upon, you know, what we're seeing with the media? Yeah, it's stupid. I mean, you know, who cares if you're first, you know, as long as you're right, you yeah. know, and you, you deliver the stuff. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I get so frustrated with, with that side sometimes, um, you know, just because of the variety of things and how journalism, and I wouldn't even say journalism, just how the media has evolved, you know, it, it's, it's instant, you know? I mean, social media is great. Social media sucks as well sometimes. Um, and, you know, everybody mouthing off, um, 
you know, I know a lot of tracks and series have put some stuff into play and you're familiar with some of them. You know, if you say something, guess what? You might not be able to get into the racetrack. And, and it's only to try to protect certain things, you know, because sometimes what you say about a track or a series, you know, can really have big dividends on whether a new fan comes to the racetrack if they see that. And I think people don't understand when they open their mouth, they should probably, and I do this a lot, I'll get mad on social media and I'll type the darn thing out and I'll go, hmm, should I do that? What is my wife or my mom going to say about that? <laughs> you know, and then I erase it. Um, and some people should probably take that 24 hour rule. And if they still feel that way in 24 hours and they want to go and put that out in social media, by golly, go and do it. Uh, but uh, to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's just crazy. Go later, then go get it. <laughs> yeah. And it's an interesting aspect, you know, unfortunately we sometimes pertain in, or we, we, we dabble, I guess, in the adult beverages and sometimes a tweet might pop up that <laughs> wasn't from us consciously. And then the next day we'll delete it. That's our 24 hour rule. <laughs> yeah. If we agree with it when we're, you know, <laughs> coherent, then, you know, it probably meant something. So uh, hey, I've, I've done the same thing, dude. I, I remember people were bashing speed 51 short track draft a couple of years ago and um it was like midnight and you know just it was a good night and i got on there and i started responding to people you know and and i went to the office the next morning and rob blount who worked for us you know said was that you and i'm like yeah he goes i love when you get on twitter like that <laughs> he says i got a, tw a text from noah gregson going who's handling the speed 51 twitter right now so you know it, it's fun because a lot of times I'll get on there and like Freddie Kraft and I went back about his, you know, his giants and the whole Philly Washington game and all that sort of stuff. And I just tried to instigate a little bit and he got all riled up, but uh, if you do that, it's fine. But you know, there, there's a line that you can cross between having fun and, you know, calling out somebody for something that maybe happened that they didn't even want to happen. And that you don't even give them a chance to try to rectify something. Right. So in this year that 2020 has been, obviously there's been tons of challenges for the tra for tracks themselves with, you know, local regulations and stuff and, and events getting postponed. But it, in the media aspect, has it actually allowed for a little bit more growth potentially, whereas people, in some events people can't even go to and they're only allowed to, you know, watch through Speed 51 or Mad TV. Yeah, I, I think yeah, everything has evolved this year. And, and we've seen it from, you know, the, uh, the Mav TV side and the Lucas Oil uh, streaming side and even Speed 51. Um, and I, I know talking to a lot of other people, you know, um, that obviously within COVID times and the, the capacity limits and so forth, you know, a, a lot of people bash, uh, whether it's Speed 51 or, you know, it, it could be Dirt Vision, it could be whomever, you know, they bash them and they don't realize what the business structure is. Any time that these entities do something, I would say 99% of the time, the track is getting some revenue or the series or something like that. And they don't realize that. Oh, the pay-per-view is way too much. All right, dude, listen, then, then go to the racetrack. We'd love for, I don't want you to watch the stream, honestly. I don't want you to watch the stream. I want you to go to the darn racetrack and have fun and watch some good racing. But if you can't for whatever reason, Okay, then basically when it's a pay-per-view, you usually match the ticket price. Well, now you don't have fuel, you don't have a hotel, you don't have, you know, whatever else. And, and you get to sit back and watch it and then hopefully go to the next one. So what we saw this year is that I, I can give you, for instance, Cherokee Speedway, Scott Childress and Daphne, South Carolina, the place your mama warned you about. They, they had called me, Bob. I think, you know, we can work with the government and we can get a race. And so Scott Childress, myself, a lot of people, we worked with the local government in South Carolina and, and we're talking about, um, this was the first race in the South and there was a sponsor behind us, but he and I promoted that first race at Cherokee Speedway. And basically what we did in very difficult times is all that pay-per-view money initially went towards the purse. It was a $42,000 purse that had to be paid. Okay. Well, there wasn't much after that, but we held a race and you know what, you know, uh, you know, some of the people said, well, why do we do that, Bob? You know, that's, 
that's crazy, you know, because we didn't make money on it. You know what? It felt good in my heart uh, that we were able to have a race. The racers were able to race. They were, you know, cooped up for a while and frustrated and people got to watch it. And in a difficult time in America, the world, okay, people, yes, they had to pay a pay-per-view price, but they still were able to watch it. And that just felt good to me. And you got people like Stafford, depending on how many pay-per-views, they add more money to the purse. I mean, all that stuff is good, but I caution that in good times where that is fine. And I think if, if it can be done, it's awesome. But these promoters, these owners, sometimes they're barely getting by. And sometimes the revenue that's brought in by whomever it is as a streaming partner is helping them pay their bills. And sometimes you're not always, these operators are not always going to be able to give some of that money back to the purse. That, I, that's incredible that you just said that because you answered my next question through Sorry. every sentence that you said there. Because my next question was going to be there. There was a lot of people that had the argument of, you know, if you're watching on TV, then you're not at the racetrack. So what was your argument towards that? But you just covered all of that in a pretty, pretty flawless stream there. So uh, thank you for that. But, um, you know, I, I think you do a phenomenal job. I think Speed 51 needs to continue doing what they're doing because, you know, there's, you know, you guys do a lot of stuff for, for places that we probably can't go to or, or, you know, would love to be at, but just circumstances are what they are. So uh, I, I think that you, you, you crush it out of the park every time and uh just just keep doing what you're doing man we appreciate not it. every time though not every time well, what's, what's, your biggest blunder? Blunder? what's your biggest blunder something that you maybe maybe you think should have gone a different way a, a lot of those streaming you know side of things has evolved over time and i think that's something that uh you know at least according to the speed 51 side of things there have been a lot of blunders in regards to drop streams or bad quality or whatever it may be and and i can tell you what uh, from the that side of things it, it's never because of a lack of effort and we've done a lot of stuff behind the scenes to help people that have had trouble and people don't understand that but um, those, those streams and the drops and the evolution on how to do it um, you know, has, especially in some of these remote areas, has been an embarrassment to myself, uh, to Speed 51 as a company. And I know, you know, things are being, you know, done right now to ensure that uh, new technology, um, new investments for them. And, and from the Lucas Oil side as well, you know, new things have been, you know, going forth there uh, to be able to ensure that people can get these streams if they're paying the subscription or the pay-per-view that they'll continue to be able to watch it. Because I tell you what, social media, that needle goes crazy when the stream drops. And I get it, I, I've been there, I've gotten frustrated before and I've been part of it and home and watching and I've been frustrating, what the heck's going on? So um, I understand it um, and you know I can tell you that no matter who it is, it could be Dirt Vision, it could be Flo, it could be the Lucas Oil folks, or Speed 51, no matter who it is, uh, they work hard to make sure that they get the stream, but people have to understand how difficult it is sometimes in some of these rural geographic areas. If only they took that 24 hour rule and you know, they implemented that during that, I think that you'd probably be able to figure out that stream within 24 hours and they would have been, you know, it would have been fine. It would have never, that tweet would have never been out into the airwaves. But uh, yeah, people, you know, people go from zero to a hundred pretty quick on, on the social media. But I think that these streams are important. And, and like you said, with some of this money going back into the actual racetrack, it just assures that although we can't get to the racetrack today, it means that we can get to that racetrack at some point in the future. And uh, it's, you know, all this media is important in keeping these racetracks alive so that we can attend them in person at some point in our lives. And get to that 293? 293, 293, baby. 293 number. So so one question I do have for you, kind of yeah. kind of wrapping things up here a little bit. I know you're a busy guy, so we'll get you on your way here. But, um, you know, one thing I like to ask everybody, you know, going to a racetrack in general or going to or being a part of auto racing, you know, some people like the speed, some people like, you know, actually driving side by side with people. Some people like going different places and traveling. Other people just like hanging out with people. So what is it that brings Bob Dillner to the racetrack? What is it that keeps you fiending to get back to a racetrack every weekend? I'm really good, glad you asked that question. I love the questions that you guys have been, you've been, you know, shooting at me because I realized it not this past year, but the year before 
Um, sometimes you lose sight and it's business and you got another TV show to do and that sort of thing. And sometimes you don't get to appreciate and feel what you did as a kid. And I went to Madison International Speedway in Wisconsin uh, for an ARCA race. And I know ARCA hasn't had the best car counts or anything like that. But during practice, I sat up in the grandstands, in the pit grandstands in turn number one. And, and I heard the noise that I fell in love with. And, and it was that type of racetrack where you're off the gas, you're on the brake, you kind of burp it in the corner, you know? So it's, oh, 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 you know, and you get back up on it. And that just, I said, man, that's what I love right there. I, I remember watching like a Mike Uanitsko, who was just fantastic. And, and for a short period of time was one of the best on the Wheel of Modified Tour. But watching him, you know, as a, I think he was like a 16 year old battling against some of those veterans at, at Riverhead Raceway back in the day. And he was able to manipulate that throttle in such a way that just made me, my heart beat. And I, I think it's that sound and the bad to the bone look of those race cars that I've always fell in love with. And, and this is a passion for me. I make a living out of it, um, but at the same time, I love it, you know, and a lot of people, you know, like, hey, we're going to go out to dinner, you know, you want to join us? Man, I, I'm going to go to a Power Eye midget race down the road at Macon Speedway because it's down the road from Granite City, Illinois, where the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series is. And, you know, I love doing that. And I, I think that's the biggest thing for me is um, that noise, the looks of the cars. I can tell you whether a car is going to be slow or fast. You guys can too, uh, by the looks of it and the attitude. Uh, so I think those are the things that really just, uh, you know, make me fall in love with the sport all over again. Well, I, I've, I've always said that whether it be building or driving, you know, race cars in general, whatever it is that you're doing with it is very much an art form, uh, especially on the racetrack. Those, those behind the wheel are, are very much artists, in my opinion, in terms of what they're doing with it. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to hear that you, you say that. So you have anything else, Bradley? Oh, just the last thing, just, just what you were saying about what brings you back to the racetrack. I think the one thing that I realized that so like growing up as a kid, for me, it was the atmosphere and obviously the experience and the sounds, the smells, the sights and all this stuff and, and track attendance around this general area for whatever reason has, has started to decline a little bit, I would say. But I think that this year, it was nice to get like reinvigorated going to Stafford. Like, like we've talked about Stafford a lot and just how great of a job that they do. Just even a weekly show there. It was like, I was sitting in the grandstands and there was a couple of times I actually went by myself. Um, and I just had some friends that, that are there and eventually, you know, I'll, I'll stumble upon them, but uh, just sitting there by myself and just kind of looking around and like getting the atmosphere and just being like, wow, this is like, this brings me back to being a kid almost where, you know, I, this, I don't know what the attendance looked like this year. Obviously, this is 2020, so maybe more people were even at the racetrack. So it was such there was so little to do. But uh, just sitting at Stafford for a weekly show this year really kind of brought me back to my roots as a kid. I mean, like this is what I remember, where it, just the passion and, and the excitement and just how not packed the stands were because they had a capacity limit, but it was like everyone just knew everyone, and you know there was yelling and screaming good and bad. And, and it was just something that brought me back to being a kid. And that's what keeps me going back to the racetrack. So, um, and, and that's what I like, you know, uh, I'll give you, for instance, uh, this year, I went to Florence Speedway um, outside of Cincinnati in Kentucky, Union, Kentucky. And I went there with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. And when hot laps came out, I was just looking at, at the fans. I was up in the tower and I'm looking at the fans and they have all their racing shirts on. That's something a little bit different too from dirt to pavement. Everybody's got a racing shirt on in the dirt crowd. And every time a race car came out in the racetrack, they're pointing, they're going, oh, look, he's there. And, and you know, in pavement, we, we complain when the entry list is not out because we want to know who's coming to the racetrack. Well, dirt, I just talked to Tony Stewart's team uh, just down the road from here. And, you know, I said, what's Tony's schedule like? And it's like, well, we got like, you know, they showed me that they got like four possible races on a single day. And it depends on the mood that Tony's in or weather or whatever. And he'll just show up. There's no harm in just showing up these days. You don't have to have an entry list, but all those people in, in, in Florence there at that racetrack, which is awesome, by the way, they ride the rim there and bang off the boards. It's unbelievable. 
Um, but they were so passionate about seeing tur Turbo Tyler Erb and, you know, uh, Rocket Man Josh Richards and Superman Jonathan Davenport that, you know, that right there showed you that's what racing's all about. That's what we need to have. And I'm glad you experienced it at Stafford. I've experienced it in so many places. And I want to see more people, especially on that pavement side, be able to get back to that feeling and bring that family and have fun. And, and these owners, track promoters, need to have some special deals for families as well. I will say that. Um, but uh, if we can get that feel back that you guys know, um, that's the single biggest problem to overcome in racing right now. How do, how do we do it then? If you if you're owning a racetrack, if if you're if I'm going to Bob Dillner Speedway, Winchester what, Speedway. Okay, so that's that's your place. All right, uh, what are you doing that's that's bringing me back? What what is it? What are the like three key things that you're doing to bring us back to that racetrack every week? Affordable tickets, number one, uh, a carnival-like atmosphere, um, and some special things that are are built into the program that are not going to be racing related. That can like for the Winchester 400. Uh, we brought in some amusement rides, all right? So we put the fun slide up, uh, we put a rock climbing wall, um, and we had a couple other things that were just fun things for people. I mean, we had adults going down the fun slide, okay? Uh, I wanted to, I never got to because I was a little bit busy. Uh, we brought in like carnival food. Instead of having our own vendors there, which we can give you your, your ordinary hot dog or hamburger, but we brought in carnival vendors with funnel cakes and corn dogs and burgers and pizza and all sorts of stuff. Fill up that midway, make people want in down times, because down times is the worst thing that you can have at a racetrack. Make them want to get to the midway, say, oh, hey, in the break, I'm gonna get down there because I wanna see this, okay? Have music pumping, you know, that, that kept people excited you know whether it's just in a downtime or prior to the races or you know i went to the lucas oil off-road racing series a few years ago and they had welcome to the jungle plan as the pro four class came to the green flag you know stafford has has the songs when the sk modifieds are on that final lap how many racetracks in america don't have that how many don't have a, a vibrant electrifying announcer to engage in people. It's all about the feel that you get. And, and I think so many racetracks just, you know, are subpar. I'm not going to say fail in that, but are subpar in that. And it takes that package all together because you can have a good race. Man, people are going to talk about it. But if they had downtime and if your program ran to like, you know, 12, one o'clock in the morning, that sucks. And, and families aren't going to do that. I can tell you as a father of five, um, and I've stayed at certain racetracks, which I won't name until one o'clock in the morning. And then my kids were honorary the next day getting up and it wasn't worth staying until that late at night. It's the, that's the perfect answer, honestly. I think, I think <laughs> filling, the, filling the downtime, like you said, and, and making it a show. I mean, you said the announcers when we were at the Snowball Derby. I, I am not one for single car qualifying. I just am not, but that was a show. It was a spectacle. And 99% of that was probably the announcer keeping me up on my seat with what was going on and keeping me informed and entertained the whole time. So um, I think, I think you're just, you're one of the few that gets it, which is, it's good because we need that, especially with someone in your position. So. Hey, do you like how Robbie Harvey is who you're talking about down to five flags? And, you know, Stephen Nassi on the inside, on the inside, on the inside, contact, contact, contact. Yeah. Yes, yes, that exactly. Yeah, we're, we're very familiar with uh, uh, Marco, for Marco Thomas for, oh, the, yes. for all Star Series. He, he's a legend around here. Uh, Hold on. Austin, uh, one of my all-time favorite humans for sure. He, he's been on the show before. He's phenomenal. Um, you know, it, there's, it's an art form. Again, it's another art form to what is at the racetrack. I love Marco because he says, Travis Benjamin. <laughs> we, we got Delner to do a Marco impression. His, his delivery of just the, even just a simple, like DJ Shaw, DJ Shaw. Like it, it's, Shaw in the 60 machine. <laughs> it, just his presentation was so perfect. And it was something that, it, honestly, like you'd look forward to at the race. Like you'd go to the Oxygen 250 and you just want to hear Marco just, call it anything heat races whatever hey is it austin or adam that's at star speedway 
Uh, the announcer there. Because he's good, too. Tyler. It's Tyler. It's Tyler Morris now. Okay, Tyler Morris. We were watching, you know, like a four-cylinder class. And some guy goes, you know, he's like, ah, here goes, you know, John Smith off the track. And, oh, he's got a tree. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah, there's yeah. still no wall back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. If you can leave the racetrack with a sound bite, like the whole time it, we're, we're down at Florida, right? We're all going, contact, contact, contact. Like that's just what we were saying because you heard it a hundred times. But if you can leave the racetrack with a sound bite and knowing you had a good time, I think that that's, that's key. Yeah, and I, I go back to, you know, you talk about announcers. They're so important. James Essex has got such a cadence with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. People mimic him because he'll go, oh my, oh my, the caution is out. The caution is out. Bishop Brandon Shepard. And he's got such a rhythm to his voice that it just engages you. Um, and, and you know something special is going on. So I, I just love listening to all those guys. Well, even when the World of Outlaws come out, you know what they're going to say before the race starts. You know, every, everybody's up on their feet, you know, saying exactly what it is. You know, you wanted the best. You got them for our breasts. And everybody's yelling it. It's a scene. And it, it's all, it all just kind of wraps back into it's a show. You got to make it a show. You got to beat people interested. You got you to make it a spectacle. Hey, one of my favorite lines, I, I did the American Sprint Car Series a couple of years ago, and Brian Holbert is the announcer for the ASCS series. And he does something prior to the green flag that's pretty cool. He, he, he told me the first time, he goes, hey, you know, with a lap to go, it's mine. I'm like, all right, dude, that's less I have to talk. No problem, right? So, so it, it coming off the fourth turn, he does something with, you know, whatever. And he goes, this is what you saved your lunch money for. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> love that yeah yeah i mean everyone's got their own little unique thing that that you know is yeah. is theirs i guess and that's his <laughs> well, what, whatever you make your own niche that's that's important in 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 terms of not only brand identity but keeping people interested like i said you can't harp that point enough where you know if, if people aren't interested they're not going to come back if they're not coming back then you're not going to have a racetrack and that's that's really key and i i think like i said you know you guys do a phenomenal job at that you you specifically also do a job you know that uh, you know like no other and i think there's a reason why you know we're, we're not trying to date you by any means but there's a reason why we always used to watch you on tv and you know we still keep coming back and, and paying for those pay-per-views if we can't make the actual show so uh thank you for all that you do i mean that's I th this has been incredible i think this has been one of our better shows for sure so uh thank you for giving us your time and we know you're a busy guy no problem. Yeah, keep up the good work too. I mean, uh, I appreciate you guys having that passion and I can see it in your eyes. I can hear it in your voice and uh, we all need to work together on that. So uh, just keep up the good work and I'll keep on listening to the podcast. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, anybody trying to find you, how do they find you on the socials? Uh, Twitter is really where I'm at. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff too, but I really don't interact. Uh, so Twitter at Bob Dillner and that's two L's and uh, uh, excited about going to the Chili Bowl again. I'll be there in the desk looking at 300-something race cars behind me and then off to uh, Florida Speed Weeks with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series with uh, all those races and all those stars. Man, I can't wait to get the season started. Sounds good, man. Hopefully we'll see you down there in a few weeks and uh, you, have a, you have a good rest of your day. Appreciate it. Hey, East Bay, you got to come to the clay by the bay. I'll invite you. Just give me a call or something. I can do that. Sounds good. We'll see you down there. Race car, race car, here we go, race car.